Mr. Bergeron's on. Don't forget the popcorn, Frank. Coming, dear. Hi. Hi. Oh, there are a lot of you today. Uh, and welcome back. Um, to the second of the, uh, the seminar series for 2015 that I'm doing here at the Hudson uh, Senior Center. My name is Dr. Bergman. I work at Myrick O'Connell. Many of you have met me before, and for those of you who know me, we're Myrick O'Connell. There were 60 of us, so we pretty much do everything. This is all I do. That's the nice thing about being a Myrick O'Connell. Everything else I get confused. I give it to somebody who really knows what he's talking about, about what they do, and then they have me talk about this stuff. So. Uh, what I decided for this year is that I would take the first two presentations and make them be the kind of basic presentations that are, that are there, there tends to be a lot in them, because it's kind of something for everyone, um, and then try to do more specific topics this fall. And the reason why I mention that is I still haven't picked what I'm going to do for this fall. So if afterwards you've got any suggestions for what you want to learn about, and it'll force me to learn it too, then let me know, and I'll be happy to do that. So in Elder Law 101, uh, we talked about... The, we talked about documents. We talked about things that you would want to be needing to do when you slow down. We talked about wills and whether or not you might want to do them, whether trusts would be useful. We talked, we talked quite a bit about long-term care insurance. At that age, is that worthwhile? We talked about a lot of stuff. So today, we're going to talk about benefits. What kinds of benefits can you qualify for? And of course, we're going to talk about my old friends, Frank and Mary, and the kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. Now, I know we've used that line a lot, you know, but for those of you who are first time here, I always say that's how we can tell if, if they're my people. People get that joke. They know Peter, Paul, and Mary. The you, the younger people are like, what? That's so funny. That's so funny. So, you, you know them, and you know that their goals are very simple. They want to die and be buried in their house and be buried in the backyard. They want to make sure that each other is secure, typically they're not as worried about themselves, either of them, as they are worried about their spouse. Oh my God, what's Frank going to do without me? Oh my God, what's Mary going to do without me? So they want to make sure their spouse is secure. And then once the two of them have died, they want to leave everything they have left over to the kids, and they want to minimize leakage. They want to minimize the, the money that isn't, that, that is going to go to people other than themselves and the kids. They're trying to make sure it doesn't go to nursing homes or to the government or to the lawyers or the probate court or any of those things. So, um, and in general, if you know their assets, we're saying in this presentation that they are both 70 and their home is, is worth $300,000, same as it was about last year, although you know it's probably gone up a little bit. Uh, Frank has an iron now worth 170. It made a little money since last year. They have an annuity worth 100,000, and they have bank accounts worth 80, so they have a total assets of 650,000 dollars. He has income of 2,000 dollars a month. That's 1,500 from Social Security and 500 from pension, and she has uh, income just from Social Security, so it's hers is half of his. It, by the way, it never ceases to amaze me how many people still come in. And, they'll, and, the, and the husband will say, oh yeah, my social security is like 1800 and the wife will say, oh yeah, mine's like four. I'll be like, four? How come, it's, you know, how come it isn't half of your husband? Oh no, well, you know, no, this was the amount. You know, I mean, I worked. I worked just like my husband worked. And this was the amount they told me that I could get. And she was totally unaware that when you're the spouse, you're entitled to the higher of your spouse's social security, or excuse me, the higher of what you would have gotten, or half of what your spouse gets. Right? You're entitled to that right off the bat by virtue of being the spouse. And then when your husband or your wife dies, if that person's social security was higher than yours, then from then on in, you're entitled to get there. You're entitled to get the higher number. So I just kind of mention that because, you know, I just see it so much. And okay, it just happened last week. Somebody came in. I just The situation I just gave you, I heard from somebody last week. So that's, that, that's their role and their, and their big thing because they want to die and be buried in the backyard is they want to know when they die that they still own the backyard and that, and that in the meantime they've been able to stay at home so we're going to talk a lot about 
benefits programs that are really directly related to keeping the house and keeping yourself in the house. So first, as I told you, as I tell people regularly, it, it is great to have as your goal to stay at home. And of course, all things being equal, that is probably the best place for you to be, as long as you're safe. As long as you're safe. Because you don't want to be falling down at home and, and you know, now you've got a broken hip and, and that's kind of a one-way street. Once we start with the broken hip, you know, things don't go well, right? Uh, and if you've got, or if you have, you know, Alzheimer's or whatever, and you have early or even middle stages of dementia, you can live just fine at home as long as the home is safe so you're not going to, like, hurt yourself as long as there's kind of somebody around. So there are a set of things that you may want to be doing at that home, in that home, uh, but you're, and, and, and as a matter of fact, I think one of the people we've had in a previous presentation is this wonderful woman named Carol DiRienzo, who she and her husband, she calls herself the nurse carpenter. She's a nurse and her husband's a contractor. And for a fee, they will actually go through your house and talk to you about it and talk to you about what your current situation is and where you think you're going. And they'll suggest to you, you know, a hundred things you could do in your house. Everybody, when they think about these modifications, it's like, it's like, oh, you know, but I really don't need the ramp in the front of the house. Oh, we already have one. Well, that's number one, you know, but there are adaptations to your doorknobs, adaptations to your, to your, your surfaces on your floor. You put no slip surfaces on to reduce your risk of falling, which is always the big issue. There's a ton of things you can do. But then a question, your question is, and it's Frank and Mary's, and I've heard it from some of you folks, but how am I going to pay for that? Which is legitimate, because if you're Frank and Mary, you don't have a big, huge pot of money. You have a good-sized pot of money. You know, three hundred fifty thousand dollars is not nothing, right? But it's not a ton. I mean, it's it's they're going to be okay, but they want to make sure that they're going to be safe, so they hate to be spending that kind of money on the house. For that, there are two possibilities. One is the home modification program that is run by the state. How many have heard of that? Raise your hand. Home modification program. Well, here it is. Uh, it, if, if you are fixing up your house in order to deal with a disability that you have, if you're having trouble walking, if you're having trouble with kind of a lot of stuff, and they're very, very broad in this definition, then you are entitled to get basically a reverse mortgage from the state. To get a loan from the state of up to $30,000 on which you will not be making monthly payments, on which you will pay either very low interest or no interest. And the promissory note is due and payable only when you sell the house or on the or when you both die, right? So it's really, it works just like a reverse mortgage, except the money's actually coming from the state. Now, you know, as to what qual who you who qualifies, because there is a limit to your income in order to qualify for the mortgage in general, for the rever for this these mod these loan mod home mod modification lo mortgages or for the zero interest. What are they? Here they are. If you're a family of two, and that's Frank and Mary, and you have income between the two of you of up to $78,000 a year, you are entitled to a zero interest mortgage. Not bad, not bad. There are a lot of you here that make more than $78,000 a year. That's a lot of money, you know. If, if you make up to $157,000, you're still qualified for the program, but you have to pay 3%. Right, and you're not making monthly payments, and the and the mortgage is due and payable with the accrued interest when you sell the house or at, or at the time of your death. So it, you are, I would bet you, just about everybody here is entitled to or eligible for this program. It is run. Um, the, the the state runs this. The Disabilities Commission. They contract with agencies around the state. SMOC actually one runs the one here, the South Middle States Opportunity Council, which is located. The closest offices in Marlboro, this program is run out of, Fra out of um, Framingham. But it's really, really useful for a Frank and Mary. Now suppose it turns out that the improvements that you want to make are more than that, though. You no, know, because we're talking about the house. So there may be significant improvements. What are you going to do? Well, that's when you want to think about a reverse mortgage. So we're going to talk about reverse mortgages for a few minutes. I just talked to a lady today, just now, actually. She was in the back. She said... Thank God I talked to you about this stuff. Because she got one of these. She would not be in her house right now. She would not be in her house right now. But she got one of these. And, and she is older. I'm not going to mention any cases. No, she's 
older, right? Um, and so, but this is keeping her in her house. So, a reverse mortgage, you are eligible for one if you and your spouse, if the younger of the two of you is 62 years of age or older. Um, the amount of money that you're eligible to get from a reverse mortgage is based on two things. One, the value of your house, not surprisingly, uh, and two, the, the, your age, because the older you are, not surprisingly, the more or the more the higher the percentage of your house that they're willing to lend you, because you're not going to last that. You know, so they figure, well, you know, it's worth the risk. They're not taking as much risk. So and, now, now, and and regarding the home reverse mortgages, what I always recommend to people, I know when these things originally came out, and they've been around now for a long time, like 30 years or something. When these originally came out, there were a lot of these really kind of unscrupulous. There's a lot of annuity salesmen, right, who basically went into the reverse mortgage business. And what they would do is they'd come to you and say, well, you know, you've got all this, you know, you don't have that much in savings and you're only earning a few pennies, you know. So why don't you get a reverse mortgage, take all the money out on your reverse mortgage, and give it to me. That is, buy an annuity. Buy an annuity and we'll give you a great rate and blah, 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 blah. Right? And so many people did that, right? And they really got, a lot of them really got stuck, especially when the annuity payments ran out. What I suggest that people do consistently is, if you're going to get a reverse mortgage, so get it, and then leave it, and then leave the amount that is available to you as like a big line of credit. So it's as if you went down to a video or one of the local banks and simply got an, an equity loan, right? A line, which is really a line of credit loan, um, except you don't, you're not pulling anything out of it. Because if you're not, then the only interest that is accruing you know, on your loan is not the whole amount of the mortgage, just on the amount that you've taken out already, right? And by the way, there is this kind of myth that when you get one of these things, you can't make payments on it. That inevitably there's this ballooning lien that's growing on your house. Well, that's not true. You can make payments anytime you want. You can make the monthly payments. You can pay the interest every month and therefore keep it exactly the way it is. But the nice thing, if you're Frank and Mary, and you know, Frank and Mary are getting older, and they're saying to themselves, you know, if they find themselves into a situation that they can't make the monthly payment, and this is the problem with doing a regular line of credit loan, they don't want to feel like they're going to get a threatening letter from the bank, you know? And the nice thing about these is that that doesn't happen. Now, to give you a sense, to give you a sense of what Frank and Mary would have available, this, this is based on numbers from a month ago. So I think this is still pretty current. If Frank and Mary were uh, 70 years old and they owned this house and took out a reverse mortgage right now, um, they would have immediately available to them $103,000. The total that they would have available after a year, because they, 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 the way the reverse mortgage rules now run, um, the, the company is not allowed to give you all of the money that you could get with, right away. Among other things, I think they were trying to deal with that annuity guy. Um, so they're only allowed to give you a percentage of what you would, are totally are, are allowed ultimately. So in the, initially, you could get $103,000, which if you're Frank and Mary, that could do a lot of repairs on your house, right? Uh, and then after a year, you're entitled to another, I should have done that extra column, another something, which ends up adding up to 167000 That's the total that you, that you're, that's available. The interest rates, these are, these are, are, are typically... Uh, adjustable rate mortgages. So the interest rate right now is about 3.7%. The maximum that can increase over the life of the loan is like 5%. And by the way, I'm giving you these numbers because, not to sound, you know, they're all the same. I mean, you talk to these different reverse mortgage companies, and they're all telling you they're really special, but they all run the same. And the reason for that is all reverse mortgages, they're, they're called HECM mortgages, H-E-C-M, Home Equity Conversion Mortgages. They are all governed by federal rules. Because the FHA, the Federal Housing Administration, is guaranteeing these loans. And because they're guaranteeing them, all the, the company, these companies have to follow the FHA and the HUD rules, right? So they're all basically doing the same thing, and I think you'll find the rates are about the same. So the, rate, the interest rate is 3.7. Um, now, the closing costs. Typically, that's when people will immediately tell me, I'll never get a reverse mortgage because the closing costs are too high. Well, that... Those costs have been driven down by the market. I think there's a lot of more people are involved in these. So that would be the closing cost in this mortgage now. All in, $4,062. Right? Now, if they were 80 instead of 70, 
then they would immediately be able to get 118,000 instead of that 103, and ultimately they'd be able to get 192,000. Same closing cost. Now once again, when Frank and Mary would do this, or what I would recommend that they do this, is when they're trying to make sure they can stay in the house. That's the goal, make sure you can stay in the house. Don't try to live on it starting when you're 62. The money's not gonna last long enough, you know? But when you're older, and you want to know that you can live in the house till you die, this may be a way to do it. Um, finally, you can also get a, a reverse mortgage from the town. Did you know that? Uh, if you are 62 years of, or older, same age, um, there is, it, no matter what you have in assets, you can go to the assessor's office anytime and say, um, and I'm going to talk to you about the, what the limits, right? You can simply say to them, I don't want to pay my taxes anymore. I want to defer them until I'm dead or until I've sold the house. So does this sound familiar? It's basically a reverse mortgage that is given to you by the town. Now, the state, the state law that creates this program, which is actually Chapter 59, um, Section 5, Article 41A, if you're really curious, but <laughs> the state program that created this program says that in general, no matter what the town says, you can only qualify for this program if your total income is less than $20,000 a year. And that does take a lot of people out. It would take Frank and Mary out in this case, right? If Frank died, uh, actually, yeah, if, if Frank died, then Mary would be able to qualify because her income would only be $1,500 a month or $18,000 a year. Um, and the interest rate that they charge you is a fixed rate. This program was established, obviously, when the economy was good, so it's a fixed rate and it's 8%. And so if you're concerned about getting rid of that tax bill, which for many seniors is the biggest bill they get, except for, you know, except for food, right? It's the biggest bill. Um, if you're concerned about that, a lot of people instead will simply do a reverse mortgage, right? So pay the taxes out of the reverse mortgage and you're achieving the same, with a regular private thing, you're achieving the same goal, but with a lower interest rate. I would just mention to you though, that, that, that by law, the cities and towns have the right to change the, either of these numbers. Um, so for example, in Marlboro, where I live, um, the income threshold is $40,000, right? Frank and Mary could qualify. A lot of people on Social Security could qualify. And the interest rate is it's either 4% or zero. I can't remember because Holden, Holden also is $40,000 and I was just there and I get confused easily. But, the, the, the point is, that's, that's a town meeting issue, right? So somebody, the Council on Aging, maybe you should talk to some folks here, right? Should may want to propose this as a warrant article on a town meeting as to whether or not you want to increase this income threshold. Because I would suggest, as a matter of public policy, as a matter of town policy, what does the town lose here, right? Sure, they're not getting the check right off the bat, but they're totally secured loans, right? By the way, you cannot do this if the total amount of taxes owed is more than 50% of the value of the property. So it limits Frank and Mary slightly. It really protects the town because it means that the, the tax value is never gonna run up so high that the town's gonna lose money when they get the money back. So basically what the town is doing is they're lending money to their seniors until, so that their seniors can stay in their own house until they die and they're getting 8% interest. I would suggest to you that is not a bad matter of public policy for the town to be doing that. So anyway, that's real estate tax deferral. So, um, and as I mentioned, they can modify up to $40,000, they can modify the interest, the town can modify the interest rate down to zero. One final thing, this tax deferral program can actually come at the same time that you have a reverse mortgage. Because while typically reverse mortgages, reverse mortgage lenders would not allow you to have this tax accumulating on your property, this tax lien, because typically the tax lien, no matter when it's owed, when, when the tax becomes owed, jumps out in front of all other liens. First mortgage, second mortgage, typically that's the case. And therefore, if I were a bank, I, I would, you know, and I just given you a reverse mortgage for $200,000, I would say, well, no, you cannot start not paying your taxes because the bill for the taxes is gonna come in front of me when this house gets sold, right? But that's not the case in Massachusetts. There's actually a special section of the tax deferral law that says that the reverse, that, that reverse mortgages take priority over tax deferrals. 
Therefore, and I've had, I have this in, in, in Marlboro, I have a woman, and once again, it's the only reason she's still in her house. She's 94 years old. She had very little, when she came to me originally, she had very little savings. She needed a lot of help to stay at home. She needed a lot of home care. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. Um, so she needed a lot of care, but also her tax bill was her biggest bill. Um, so we got, her, we, we got her qualified for this program called the Frail Elder Waiver, which we'll talk about. Um, we got her a reverse mortgage so that she could fix the bathroom because she was having to use a commode because she couldn't get into the bathroom. It's in one of these old little, you know, capes, right? Um, um, and, 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 and she, so she, and she did this, right? She did one of the, the, and she did one of these tax deferrals so she got rid of her biggest bill. And I think now she'll be able to stay in her home unless her health deteriorates until she dies. So that's what these pro th those programs are about. So that's all about the house. So what about staying in the house? What can you do? Well, the first thing that you need to do, right, if you want to know about the programs that will help you stay in the house, know your ASAP. We've talked about this before. Each area of Massachusetts, each region, there are 27 of them, has an aging services access point, an ASAP, A-S-A-P. Here, that's Bay Path Elder Services. Their offices are in Marlboro. Their job, they are paid with taxpayer money, federal and state taxpayer money, and their job is to know all of the programs that you could qualify for, and then to help you qualify for them. If they call you, they're not there to sell you anything, right? They are there to help you figure out what you are entitled for. Among other things, um, you know, you know some of their basic programs. Meals on Wheels was actually created at the same time as these ASAPs. This was the Older Americans Act passed by LBJ when many of us were like under 30 a long time ago. Who, got, who knew that we'd eventually be using these programs, right? So there's Meals on Wheels. That's how it got started, was through the Older Americans Act. The Lifeline program, through which you, know, you can have, I know this is relevant for one of our relatives. She just, I mean, she gets, she gets seizures. Um, and seizures often induce heart attacks, you know? But so Lifeline, for, she's living by herself, which is fine, just great, she's in her house. Except if she has a seizure, when she goes down, she doesn't have time to call 911, right? But with the lifeline, you press the button, the ambulance shows up. Now, you know, it's embarrassing, the ambulance shows up, but you're not dead, that's something, you know? So it's got a lot of pluses to it. So there's lifeline, there's meals on wheels, and then they will, they will just give you advice. They will, you know, you talk to them over the phone, and they'll talk to you, they'll ask you some questions, they're not trying to be nosy. They just want to know what other programs you might be eligible for, among others, so-called basic, their basic home care program, which many of you may be getting right now, uh, or ECOP, their extended um, program. Both of these programs are funded by your state tax dollars as opposed to your federal tax dollars. Um, so this is not mass health, and therefore there's no asset limit to how much you can have and still qualify for these programs. Um, basic will give you, my recollection serves typically six to eight hours of home care um, in a week, and when I say home care, while the mass health programs typically are limited to giving you care once you need assistance with the activities of daily living, which are, this is always like a test, um, uh, addressing, eating, bathing, toileting, and transferring, getting across the room. You need, if you need physical assistance with those, then you can qualify for those programs. This one, it's like they'll, they'll make a meal for you, right? They'll do shopping for you. They'll do a bunch of things, right? And you qualify, there's no asset limit. There is an income limit, and you need to pay a copay. There's a sliding scale. And, and there's a lot of numbers in this slide, that's why you've got one of them in front of you. But Frank and Mary, Frank and Mary, a couple, would be eligible for either of these programs. Um, they'd have to make a copay of, of up to $101 a month. Now remember, under ECOP, they might be getting 12 hours of home care a week times four weeks would be what, 48 hours? Times the average cost of home care right now, if you were, if you were privately buying it, probably between 20 and $25. So it's a benefit of 800 to $1,000 a month. And, you're, and then you need to pay a copay of $100 or $101 and you'll qualify for this program. So probably many, many, many of you qualify for the program um, even if, if, if you're paying a copay. And once again, if your goal is to stay home, once, if that's the goal, is to stay home, that's the point of having some of this assistance, right? If you just need a little bit of help, right, and you don't want to be moving to assisted living, you know, because you're thinking, oh, God, that's just going to be too expensive, this is what you want to be doing. So that's, that's a 
Those are huge programs. In addition to that, there's the VA Aid and Attendance Program. If you are a veteran, if your spouse was a veteran, if your if your spouse is dead and you're a widow and your spouse was a veteran, and, and you and did not retire with a service-related disability check that he, that he or she has been getting, right? Then you're pretty much automatically going to be qualifying for this program if if the person was a veteran who had been in active duty. The reserves don't count. If they were in active duty for at least 90 days and one day was during a period of war, and I and I, I listed the war periods because nobody can believe it. Did you know that World War II ended December 31st, 1946? Who knew, right? Or Korea. I thought Korea ended right after um, Eisenhower got elected in 52. For these purposes, it ended January 31st of 1955, right? So, and, and, and so these, they, they were, these are long periods. If you served one day, or if your spouse did, then you're eligible for this benefit. The way the benefit works is they will supplement your income up to a particular amount. Um, those amounts, if Frank and Mary are both still living at home, are up to $1,644. If Frank is dead and it's just Mary, up to $880. But the key to understanding this benefit is that when they're calculating this income number that they're supplementing up to, they subtract from your income all of your medical expenses. But they have a very broad definition of medical expenses. It could, could include, for example, any home care that you have at home. So if you are beyond the point where you need, where you can be at home safely with just basic or EPOC, right? You need some more home care, but you don't have the, you know, a lot of money to pay for home care. You can pay for some of it. This could be a very, very big supplement for you. Um, regarding this program, it had been that that no matter what you had in assets, there was no look, so-called look-back period regarding transfers in this program. Um, so that you could simply transfer your assets away and then immediately qualify. That's changing now. Um, and, so, and, and the asset limit, but the asset limit that they will look at, there's a kind of a, a myth that there's a magic number, and that number is $80,000. I've heard that myth. Right? It said that beyond, that beyond that amount, you can't qualify the program. That's not the case. It's not the case. What they will do is they will calculate, the VA will do this with you, they will calculate how much money you need in order to live the rest of your life based on your current needs. And then and, and they'll figure out an asset amount that would be sufficient to allow you to do that. Right? To the extent that you're over that number, as I say, gifting is now a problem, but the use of annuities is not. And by the way, this is the one, I mean, there are a couple of places where annuities are worthwhile. This is one of the two of them, right? Uh, if, 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 for example, you were Frank and Mary and it turned out that once the VA did their calculation, they said, no, you can really only have $200,000 in assets in order to qualify for this program, and you've got $300,000. Well, if they bought an annuity for the rest of their life, simply a term annuity that was going to make them a monthly payment for the rest of their life, they would know that they're getting all of their money back and it would instantly qualify them for the VA program. Now typically, one of the reasons I never recommend annuities is the return rates on them are terrible, terrible. So you're never doing it if you think it's a great investment, but to qualify for one of these programs where there's a lot of benefits available, it might be worth it. So, that's VA. Finally, we're gonna talk a little bit about mass health. Now, once again, many of you have heard this, or have heard parts of this, um, but this is for, this is one of the two general presentations. That's why it's Elder Law 102. Many of you have been to 102. So Mass Health, briefly, go back. Remember, those are Frank and Mary's assets. Total at value $650,000, including the house that's worth $300,000. What if Mary needs nursing home care? This is a test to see if you really were in class before. How many people think that, 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 that uh, if Mary goes into a nursing home in that situation, Frank's going to need to spend down some of these assets to cover the nursing home? Anybody? Oh, wow, you've all been to the class. Oh, I'm so discouraged. So, it is true, in this situation, if Mary needed nursing home care today, um, she could almost immediately qualify for Mass Health, which is the one government program that will pay for long-term ca care forever. Medicare will pay for these long-term care days, for days in a nursing home, but only for the first 100 days after you've left the hospital. To qualify for Mass Health, all she would have to do, she can't have more than two thousand dollars in countable assets, but she could transfer. But she can have. But Frank can own the house, 
as long as it's worth less than about $820,000, so she could just transfer the house to Frank. Frank can have cash or cash equivalent assets equal to $119,220. Do you remember he has more than that? In the example we're using, he has, they have cash or cash equivalents worth three fifty. dollars so what, what, what they would need to do is Mary would simply need to shift all of her assets to Frank. Frank would then say, keep $100,000 of his three fifty, dollars use the rest of it to buy an annuity. As long as the annuity calls for monthly payments over a term that do not exceed Frank's actuarial life expectancy. And at 80, Frank has a life expectancy of more than 10 years. Right? Um, then the purchase of that annuity is a legitimate conversion from an asset to an income stream. And Frank, as the spouse at home, is allowed to have infinite income. So Frank, so Mary could immediately qualify. If, if, if Mary went to the nursing home today, she could transfer everything to Frank tomorrow. Frank could buy his annuity the following day, and the day after that, Mary would qualify for Matt's house. Um, so the only thing that Frank and Mary would want to do in that situation, or earlier, this is what I typically recommend to folks who are getting older, and Frank's worried about taking care of Mary, and Mary's worried about taking care of Frank, is, ch is change your wills. You don't have to go take everything and put it in trust and wait five years. Don't do any of that. Change your wills to say, when I die, I want everything to go in trust for the benefit of my spouse. I want, if I, I Frank die, I want everything to go in trust for Mary. I'm going to name Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr., or one of them, or two of them, as the trustees. I'm going to set some rules that say the trust, that, that the trustees are going to use their discretion to take care of mom in any way they deem appropriate. But as long as the money is passing through this will, if Frank dies, all the assets are safe. Day after Frank dies for Mary's benefit. So in the situation we gave, if Mary goes to the nursing home, we shift everything to Frank, Mary qualifies for mass health, Frank changes his will to say he's got these asset protection, protection provisions. If Frank dies after that, all the assets remain safe because they're gonna be in trust for Mary's benefit. Following Mary's death, they can all go to the kids. They're all lean free. If Frank has died, what are Mary's options? They are more limited. Remember, those would be her assets in this situation. Her income would have gone up to $1,500 a month, right? Because now she's getting Frank's Social Security. The figure that the pension is gone. So she's living tighter. By the way, once again, in this situation, maybe they didn't do a reverse mortgage or home modifications or anything else. But in this situation, it, it may make a lot of sense for Mary to do it, just to, take, to fix up the house. So, and she, because, because now she's got very limited income, she would, as we had just mentioned, now qualify for that tax deferral <coughs> because she's earning now uh, $18,000 a year. So she's below that 20000 Even if she lives in Hudson, she qualifies because she's making less than that $20,000 a year um, maximum. Finally, now I'm going to talk about one other thing and then get to the slide. As I had mentioned earlier, and I realized after I did this presentation, I should have had a slide for this. I'm going to leave it there. I should have had a slide for this. Remember that in the, in the Frank and Mary case, if, if Mary is otherwise eligible for nursing home care, um, but instead wants to see if she can get enough home care to stay at home, because that's all she needs. She needs a lot of home care. Frank is at home. Frank can take care of her most of the time. But, you know, Frank needs some breaks, and Frank needs somebody that can help her to, you know, lift her up and do some other stuff. If that's the situation, I guess I'm going to go back a little bit. I'll go back to there. If that's the situation, Mary can also qualify for a program called the Frail Elder Waiver. The Frail Elder Waiver, F-E-W, the few. Um, and the way that program works is if, you're, if, if Bay Path Elder Services certifies that you're eligible for the nursing home, and if Mary has less than $2,000 in countable assets, then Bay Path, and Bay Path says that it's going to take 50 home care hours a week to keep Mary at home. MassHealth will pay for all the home care hours, right? as long as Mary is financially eligible. She has to have less than $2,000 in countable assets. In that situation, though, Frank can have unlimited assets. Unlimited assets. So if they're in that situation and Mary wants to stay home, all she has to do is move all of her assets to Frank and she immediately qualifies for the frail elder waiver. There is an income limit on that, though. She has to have income. Not, they don't count Frank's income at all, but she has to have income of less than $2,199 a month. That number just went up, right? Her number at this point is lower than that, right? Which means she could qualify, right? Um, what about if 
Frank has died and just Mary wants to qualify. In that situation, we have talked about the fact that there, there are these, there, obviously she's got a lot more than $2,000 in countable assets and she's got the house. However, we've talked about this, these things called D4C pooled trusts. I'm just going to talk to you about them for a second, right? A D4C pooled trust, there are four of them in Massachusetts. You can just, if you want to learn more about them, you can Google them under the words pooled trust, P-O-O-L-E-D, pooled trust. Um, they, are, they are run by nonprofits. They have to be nonprofits. What, what you can do with the pooled trust is you can transfer your money to them, and they will pool it, hence the name pooled trust, with everybody else's money, uh, and then hold that money for your benefit for as long as you're alive, and use it for whatever would be helpful to make your life better. Now, because of the mass health rules here, as opposed to in most other states, most other states for Medicaid purposes, this doesn't work. But it, for mass health purposes, it does. You can, she could, Mary in this case could simply transfer all of her assets, minus the $2,000, to the pool trust. And the day after, she could qualify for the frail elder waiver, as long as she has countable assets of less than $2,000. And the trust money could then be used to supplement her care. So say Frank's now dead, she's at home, and so she's going to need more care than like 30 or 40 hours. Maybe she's going to need 60. Maybe she's going to need some other programs. In that case, and maybe MassHealth won't pay for all that. Well, MassHealth will pay for a whole lot of stuff. And if Mary took her $350,000 and put it into the pooled trust, now there's a huge pile of money there to supplement her care for the rest of her life. So don't, I guess the, the, the message on all of this stuff, I guess on all of these programs, the message on this is, don't say no to yourself. Don't assume that you, have, that you cannot qualify for these programs. Talk to somebody about it first. Because there may, it, there may be a way that you can. Finally, uh, yeah, a word about long-term care insurance. Last time we talked about it in Elder Law 101, because we talked about, you know, you're getting all the, considering long-term care insurance, and when does it work? And we talked about that a little bit. As I mentioned then, I'm not a big fan of long-term care insurance in general, especially if Frank and Mary are both alive, because as we've talked, as we've discussed, you can avoid the nursing home cost anyway, just by structuring your assets right. So why are you paying an insurance fee, right? Um, there are some reasons to do it specifically to cover home care, and we talked about that. But in this context, in the Frank and Mary context, they're older, um, they're, 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 you know, they, they're, they're restructuring their assets. Is there any reason why they should try to have one of these policies? Or Frank's dead, right? Uh, should Mary get a policy? Well, the one kind of exception to my general feeling about these is, if you own a long-term care insurance policy, which will pay for a minimum of two years' worth of nursing home, and will pay a minimum of $125 per day during those two years, then by virtue of having that policy, right, your house is protected. If you go into, so if you're married and you have spent down your cash or you parked it in a D4C, right, and now you're staying at home and you want to qualify for mass health, um, normally in that case, if you were in the nursing home, mass health would say, well, the house isn't countable unless you intend to return home. So when you file your nursing home application or your mass health application, you always check a little box that says that you intend to return home. Even though there's no possible chance that you're going home. Because by virtue of doing that, you've made the house non-countable. So you qualify for mass health, let's say if you're married. At that point though, mass health will put a lien on the house and will collect their money from your estate or from that house when it, when it sells after you die, right? However, you want the, the, the exception to that is if instead you have one of these long-term care insurance policies, right, and you go into the nursing home, your house is completely safe. Now, there's one thing that you, I'm going to just mention. There is a, there's something, there's a trick. There's a trick that you have to be aware of, and that is when you're filing your, your mass health application at that point, you have to just say no. Instead of saying that it is your intention to return to your home, which is what you would always do if you were trying to make sure the home didn't have to get sold right away. You have to say that it's not your intention to return to your home. Otherwise, if you say it's your intention to return home, even if you have the long-term care insurance policy, once MassHealth has qualified you, they're gonna put a lien on your house and you're gonna to have to be paying, right? We just encountered this. Somebody made a mistake. 
right? You filed the wrong application. I won't go through that story, but you just need to be aware of that. A couple of other things. Up until about two years ago, up until 2013, if you had one of these policies, there was another kind of little trick that you needed to be aware of. A lot of these policies will cover nursing home care and will also cover home care. Um, and so people will sometimes, you know, they'll use the benefit typically, and they'll always by day, they'll get a, a benefit of $125 a day, and you can use it for any particular day, either to cover part of your nursing home costs or to cover your home care costs if you're staying at home. The rule had been, until this date, and I can't remember the date, in early 2013, when new legislation got passed, that if you had used up uh, some of your policies so that the remaining available days to cover your nursing home care were less than two years, even if the policy was originally for three days, right? Or if it had been for two years, if you used one day of it to cover home care, then you were out of luck, the house wasn't safe. Um, everybody kind of agreed that that seemed silly, and so the legislature changed that in 2013. So it's to all policies issued after, I think March of 2013, even if you've used all, all but one of the days on, on home care, as long as you have one day left and the policy is still in existence when you go to the nursing home, if it, if it by its terms, originally covered two years at $125 a day, you're still safe. That's a little complicated. If you have questions of that, talk to me about it. Finally, if you've got one of those old long-term care insurance policies that pays very, very little, don't throw it away, right? If your policy was issued before March 15th of 1998, excuse me, March 15th of 1999, it was issued before that date, then the minimum required payment is only $50 a day, not $125 a day. I say this because this just happened too. Last week, somebody came in. This was actually the case that I was giving you. The lady came in and she said, she, she, she came in with her husband, the husband's mother is now in the nursing home, had gone from home to the nursing home. And she said, we gotta sell the house, right? She said, all I got is this, you know, I do have a long-term care insurance policy, but it's not worth anything. I said, well, what's it worth? Said, it's only $60 a day. I said, well, when did, it, when did it get issued? She said, I don't know, it's old. I said, well, before March 15th, 1999? Well, we looked at the policy, it was 1998. I said, your ship has come in. Congratulations. The house is safe because it's their only asset. It was like a condo. It was worth a quarter of a million dollars. I said, the only thing is when we file the application for your mother, we have to make sure that we check off the box. Is she returning home? No. And she said, oh, I already filed the application. I said, you filed it? What did it say? She pulls out the copy and of course it said yes. Right? I said, yeah. I said, oh no. That's the first thing. I, did. I, said, I said, so has your mother been approved yet? Or your mother-in-law? She said, I said, get anything in the mail? You know, she said, no, I don't no, I don't think so. What do we do? I said, we're gonna file, we're gonna do file a withdrawal right now. Right? We we got you know, we 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 pulled we pulled out a form, we drafted a withdrawal, I drove to Tewksbury, which is the local office, and filed it and got a date stamp, and then had the courage to talk to a caseworker and said, Has this lady been approved yet? She said no. She hadn't been approved, which means we were safe because we've been able to withdraw, and then, we, and then the day after we reapply, but we check the box correctly. So, so that's long-term care insurance. It, 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 once again, if your goal is to stay home, and you know, I, I don't think it's worth buying a really expensive long-term care insurance policy, because it's never gonna pay the premium anyway. You know, at the good nursing homes now, price is 350 to $400 a day. Try buying a long-term care insurance policy that pays 350 to $400 a day. See what that premium looks like, right? On the other hand, buying one of these, if you've got the house, especially if it's a big house. By the way, it protects a house of any size. You have a $2 million house. If you own that policy, there's no lien, right? So it's worthwhile. So that's everything about Elder Law 102. I hope some of this was useful to you. As you, as you know, uh, we put all these up on our YouTube channel, as well as the Hudson Cable TV is, is kind enough to replay these several times. Um, so if you want to see it again, or if somebody was he wanted to be here, just tell them to look on the YouTube channel. It's actually not mine, it's Frank and Mary. It's called Elder Law Frank and Mary. The goal of life is to sleep well at night. So I hope that this helps you. Any questions? Any questions? Yes, ma'am, and you, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Yep. I'm going to repeat the question. Like, say I Yep. And she still can stay in the house. Yep. But then if she has to go to the nursing home, 
So the question is, you have a reverse mortgage, and you're Frank and Mary, and you both died. How long does the does how long is it before that note, which is secured by the mortgage, becomes due? The answer is a year. It's due and payable a year after you die, or a year after you have, or or, or after you have stopped living there for a year, whichever one comes first. So by the way, I'll just give you a line of the example. I just had this have one of these conversations with with um, someone regarding this kind of issue. Um, and so they own, they do a lot of work in Martha's Vineyard. I have some torture, I have to go to Martha's Vineyard. So they own a house in Martha's Vineyard. How do they work? They own a house in Martha's Vineyard. The husband and wife are not in great shape. The wife is seeming like she's going to stay in a nursing home. The husband's got physical problems, but is okay mentally. And so they're looking actually at a place around here, and one's going to be looking at assisted living, and the other one's looking at nursing home, right? And that's great, because they're going to be kind of down the hall from each other. But, and, and we can qualify the wife um, because she's in, she's, we're going to qualify the wife for Mass Health because we transfer all the assets to the husband, except that the hu house is in Martha's Vineyard. So what do, we wanna, what do we do about the fact that he's moving into assisted living? Right? Does that mean that that house turns into his home? Right? Now, as it happens, we've actually had this case, and I think that for those purposes, we're going to be safe. For Mass Health purposes, we're going to be able to say, it still his intention to return to Martha's Vineyard after the wife dies, so he's just there temporarily, which could be a long time, while the wife is in the nursing home. But they have a reverse mortgage, right? So the question then is, if he's moved up here for a year, and she's in the nursing home, so she's not going home. If he's moved up here for a year, then does that mean the reverse mortgage gets due and payable? And the answer is, as long as she, he goes back for a day, Right? For one day, every year, then that clock stops if he goes back for a day. Right? So he needs to go back and kind of document the fact that if I were on the safe side that I were going back. But, so that's, but in general, that's how it works. So it's a year from date of death or if you haven't been there for a year. Uh, yes, ma'am? Yes. Um, you know, I'm just wondering, because I have a mortgage on my house. Yeah. Each town in Massachusetts uh, set its own rate for this estate. The, the question is on the tax deferral statute, does each town set its own rate or is it, does, it, does the state? The state sets a minimum and a maximum. The state sets a minimum, says you're always eligible as long as you make less than $20,000. But the town has the right to increase that now to a particular amount, which right now is 40000 That's the maximum. Similarly, the town will always charge 8% interest on the deferred taxes unless the town votes to reduce that number. And in a town that has to happen, at to, but they can reduce it to as, much, as low as 0%. In a town that has to happen at town meeting, in a city it can happen by vote of the city council. Okay? Yes, ma'am? Yes. Yes. That is correct. That's, it's, it's as if they're giving you a reverse mortgage. It, it, the question is, is it deferred or is it waived? This is the, these are the, the, what I'm talking about is a deferral. There is an abatement program through which they'll abate a smaller amount. But I didn't want to talk about that. I wanted to focus on the deferral. Because once again, think of it that way. You're not avoiding the tax. You're simply deferring it until after you die. Which for many of us is, that's not bad. But, but, but it's not completely avoided. Yes, ma'am. And then, yes, ma'am. A seminar on just married without any friends. I'll think about that. I think that'd probably be a good idea. Because there's a lot of married. Not too many friends. <laughs> a lot of married. Uh, other questions? Other questions? Yes, ma'am. You, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yep. Yep. If you have a policy that will that, is, that will pay $138 a day for three years, then your house is safe. Just make sure you keep your premiums up. If you had a policy that was dated before March 15th of 1999, that daily payment could have been as low as $50 a day. But in either case, you're safe. 
just just if the policy is dated before 2013, make sure that you don't use up more than a year of those benefits on home care. If you've got a home care option, if you've got a home care option and you use a year and a day with the home care option, and then go into the nursing home, but, so you have less than two years worth of payments to the nursing home left on that policy when you go. The policy will no longer protect your house. So make sure you make, you got to pay attention to that number. You, you miss by a day, a day is everything, right? You, in that policy, if you go a year and a day using home care, the policy becomes useless for work, purposes of protecting the house. Yeah, uh, yes, sir? And I think we're done. Yes, sir? Uh, I'm retiring at yeah. 65, so I got Medicaid. I just got, you figured it out? I turned 65 in January. I was scratching my head. I'm on their website. I'm supposed to know this stuff, right? How does this work? My question is, my wife's only three. Yeah. Is she eligible for MassHealth? The, the question is, is she eligible? For, either of you is always eligible for MassHealth. Because MassHealth is, as opposed to Medicare, MassHealth is, is a state name for Medicaid. Medicare you get by virtue of being old or disabled. Medicaid you get by virtue of being poor. So if you're married, right, and you're living at home, and you no, know, if you're if you, the two of you and you're living at home and you try to qualify for Medicare, I can almost guarantee you you're not going to qualify because your income's going to be too high. Income for a couple on Medicare at home is like seven hundred dollars a month, eight hundred dollars a month. The only exception to that is if you need nursing home care. Because we talked about that, in that case, there is no limit to your income. Or if you need nursing home care and you want to stay at home, and therefore want to qualify for Mass Health to help you stay at home, in that case, there is an income limit, but it's the number I gave you, two thousand one hundred ninety-nine dollars. Mass Health for just basic. Care. No, that's that's that, no, that's where Medicare comes in, and as you know, you don't qualify for Medicare until you're sixty-five. Or unless you've been on disability for at least a year. If you've, won, if you've been on Social Security disability for at least a year, then you are automatically eligible for that. So how is it that my uh, brother-in-law and his wife, who don't work, are both on, no, she's on mass health, and they're both under 65? If he, yeah, that, that, if, if, they, if they are on mass health and they're both under 65, they're not making a lot of income. They have good they're not making a lot of income. Other questions? Now you can hit. I'm oh, sorry, last question, then we'll... Yes? If uh, Frank has died, yeah. and... I'm sorry, I have to have to be fine. I'm getting deaf. I can't hear. Yeah? Frank has died. Yeah. Mary has put all her money into a pool trust. Yeah. Mary dies. Yeah. What happens to the excess? If Frank has died, Mary has decided she's going to stay home, but she wants to qualify for Matt's house, so she puts all the money into the pool trust. And then Mary dies, what happens to the money in the pool trust? First, the pool trust will take a percentage of what's left. Second, MassHealth will have a claim against what's remaining in there to get repaid. So you're not doing the pool trust as an asset. You know, it's not like gift, it's not like you can't just, it's not just giving it away. There are some, real, some limits on it. Okay. But you can't get qualified that way. Thank you very much. Okay, thank we'll you. see you in the fall. Yeah.